There we go. that our bookstore resides on the ancestral unceded land of the Confederate tribes of Warm Spring. In our immediate area are also the unceded lands of the Confederate tribes of Siletz Indians and the tribes of Grand Ronde. We encourage everyone to learn more about the land you occupy and the story of its peoples. A quick reminder of upcoming events. On July 14th, Ben author Andrea Wickberg will be here to talk about Grading on a Curve, her self-published title. Um, and on July 19th, join us for the rescheduled event with Jess Boschemann for Hike 366, A Woman's Tale of Hiking Adventures All Year Round. And as we see the weather turn this hour a little bit, just remember, <laughs> to hike in Oregon means to hike in the rain. <laughs> That was never really true in Bend and has become more true. Um, so we just invite you to visit our uh, website, roundaboutbookshop.com, for more event information, book clubs, and books you should be reading. Uh, we are recording tonight's event for our YouTube channel. You can find all of our events back to May of 2020 on there. So if there's one you missed, please go check it out. You also get to see various rooms of my house because I was hosting all of those <laughs> virtual events and various shades of my hair color, from blue to purple. It's good stuff. Um, tonight, I am so excited to chat with Laura Stanfill about her debut, Singing Lessons for the Stylish Canary. Set in 1800s France, this book transports the reader to the musical town of Mirvay, where Henri Blanchard is expected to continue the family business of serenettes. However, Henri would rather make lace and spend his days with his best friend, Amy. He also believes he has a magical power. After a mistake lands him in jail, Henri is forced to flee Mirvay. I got to read an advanced copy in January while I was at the Oregon coast, and I couldn't put it down. Um, great weather to be reading a book that you don't want to put down as well. <laughs> so um, we are so excited to have Laura here um, all the way from Portland. Thank you for making that drive. She has brought a serenette with her. Um, I want to just jump right in. So um, please tell us where this book came from. Well, I have been writing since I was in second grade, first grade, and so there were a lot of iterations of books before this, partially finished books, finished novels, and I the, the two novels that I had with an agent that didn't sell were both contemporary fiction, and so I thought for this book I was going to write another contemporary novel, and it was going to be probably kind of devastating the way I thought that people needed to hear sad books. I don't know. I was, I was trying to write what I thought a serious writer would produce. And so I started doing research thinking I'd have this present day music box book. I grew up with music boxes in my house, only child. There were automatons in my bedroom. <laughs> and I don't know if you've ever been in a room with an automaton, but they sit there on the shelf like this. <laughs> and they stare at you. And they also never do anything wrong, ever. So, as an only child, knowing my parents prized their collection of automatons and they were staring at me, I was like, I better be good. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so I was gonna try to unpack the collector mentality of music boxes and what it's like to, to care about something that's so, such an old fashioned concept that's not really relevant today. And as I was doing the research for this novel, I came across the word serenette also known as a bird organ. Uh, it was um, in a Music Box Society International glossary, which I knew about because I used to go to Music Box Society meetings and I would sit in the back of the room like my kids are here trying to read and do my own thing while my parents learn about jukeboxes and the melodians and, and player pianos and such. So anyway, I found the bird organ in this, um, in this 
glossary, and I thought, wait, what? And it said C. Serenet, and under Serenet, it said Canary Trading Feral Orchid. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> what is this? So I went on a wild goose chase, trying to learn more about it, and 15 years later, out popped a novel. <laughs> and we're here tonight, <laughs> after much revision and much heartache, and, and I don't think a lot of people maybe know how long it really can take from both concept to a finished manuscript, but from a finished manuscript to a produced book. Yes. So where, like what, so we're talking maybe like a good dozen or so years of writing and revising, but where did you like, you pitched it to someone and they said, aha, we have found what the world was missing. Well, <laughs> there were two steps to that. Step one was finding an agent. And my agent and I met over coffee. It's kind of an unconventional story, but I was in Berkeley. She lived in Berkeley. We had mutual friends. She used to live in Portland. So we sat down for coffee. And the first thing she did, she had this really long, gorgeous hair. She pulled her hair out across the coffee table and held it out like this <laughs> and said, we have the same hair color. And I did this. And that's how I met my agent. <laughs> Which sounds like just a silly little thing, but it turns out we just bonded right away. And a while into our relationship, I mentioned I had a novel. And she said, I only take one client a year. I don't really, I'm not really looking for anybody. And she was afraid to hurt my feelings because she has such particular taste. As we know, those of us who have worked in publishing or been, been published, it's very personal. And she was really afraid that this publisher she liked and she wanted to pitch books to would have a novel that wasn't for her at all. So we kind of tiptoed into a conversation of like, well, what's it about? Well, Canary Trading Music Box. Wait a second, what? When can you tell me more? And I was like, I told her a little bit, a little bit. She said, well, can you send me the manuscript? Well, I sent her like five pages because I was afraid she wouldn't like it. And then she said, can you send me more? And I said, more. So eventually she said, it needs work and I love it and I would like to represent you. And then it finally sold during COVID. I think because it's a feel good story, there's joy and love and hope in my book. And I think we all needed that. It sold in, um, I guess a year ago, a year, a year ago, March. So a little bit more than a year to pub date, which is extraordinarily fast from my perspective as a book publisher. slotted me and that's who made it work. Yeah. How do you feel about a book coming out though without kind of the normalcy of book publishing? So for those of you who don't know, Laura is a publisher. Her publishing company is called Forest Avenue Press. Sorry, I should have mentioned that. Um, we have carried quite a few of her books in the past. We'd be happy to order more. Um, you know that it can take two to three years. Yep. So looking at that, already having been in the pandemic for like a year and a half when we ran into each other at PNBA in October and they were, you know, talking about your book already. But that's, I mean, you're still thinking, how do you do events and how do you promote it? And, you know, whether it's feel good or not, it's, we're still in the middle of this weird supply chain issue and pandemic. So how did that feel? It was scary, and I was like, I know why I like to leave extra time for my authors, and I, you know, if I went in doubt, let's push it back a little, because I want to be able to handhold my people, and I'm probably lucky that in the midst of a global pandemic and having a short lead time on my book, I knew a lot about publishing, so I didn't completely falter and get terrified. I mean, I got a little terrified, but because it's a big deal to put your work into the world, but <laughs> but I knew how the process worked, and so I was able to go in and recognize what needed to happen and how it was going to go. But yeah, I was sweating before PNBA because they said, we're going to try to get ARCs out for this big bookseller show, and I had a deadline, and I met my deadline, and they didn't meet their deadline. It took a really long time to get copy edits back for the art. Mm. And it was one of those, like, can you turn this around in 48 hours kind of deal? And I was like, that? Yep, professional, I got it, did it. 
might have been three days, but it was really fast. Yeah. And then because of the supply chain, all the printers are backed up. It's really hard to get paper. Nobody has enough staff. I thought, oh, yeah, right. So I made postcards for PNBA. And I thought, okay, me, I'm being so relaxed about this. I can't imagine my book's going to be at this bookseller convention, but I'll be there. And I'm going to smile. I can sign postcards for people. It'll be fine. And then they did get the books out in time. Yeah. But I think a lot of this has been practice around anxiety and practice around perfection. Because as writers, we really like to make everything perfect, but there's no such thing as a perfect piece of art. It's art appeals differently to different people. So yeah. I loved at PNBA though that you were right next. So her table for Fourth Avenue was right next to Lantern Fish. Mm -hmm. So then they're like, here's Laura's book, and then I'm talking to Laura about one of their no, it was it was very fun to be like, who am I talking to about booking an event with you? <laughs> it was so great, too, because uh, Lanternfish had never been out to the Pacific Northwest before. They're based in Philadelphia, and they thought, okay, we have an author who knows booksellers. Let's try this conference. Yeah. And I was like, oh, this is so great. It's like my favorite thing to have my publicist, my publisher in town, and then to be able to say, like, hey, Julie, come me, please, come me. Yeah. yeah. It was good. It was it was great networking. I mean, it, you couldn't yeah. ask for more, especially so even as a publisher. I mean, this is still your debut, yeah. right? Like this is still taking a chance on and the I other side of it. Yeah, exactly. So I'm so glad it worked out. So um, I mean, tell us a little bit more about you know the book, the storyline, etc. Do you have a favorite character? Do you? I mean, I know that's so hard to ask people, but no, sometimes it's... there is one. There, uh, I have a lot of favorite characters. This book, having gone through so many revisions over the years, I, I feel deeply for the characters who are on the page and also for the characters that got axed. In fact, I wrote an omit for them just to get that out of my system. <laughs> sort of a eulogy, like farewell to, <laughs> to all these characters who are never going to show up. But I, my characters, I started out writing, I wanted to write about fathers and sons. I'm an only child, and I always looked up to my dad. He has a smart engineering brain, and he's super into it. Like, he can fix a music box. And what surprised me over the years of writing the book is that even though I was writing about a son who didn't match his father's abilities or wasn't the same, the same old as his father, I was processing being the creative daughter with a super rigid, scientific brain father, but also it was all the women characters who came to life in the book, and they didn't, they didn't take no for an answer. I tried to get some of them to do certain things and to follow my plot plan, and they just were stubborn. Um, in fact, I had an ending I jettisoned of about 150 pages. And one of the characters showed up in the new ending. And I was like, really? <laughs> and she's a completely different, she has different circumstances, but it, it's still her, and she has the same name as the character I cut in that former ending. She just lives in a different place now, but it's her. And it was, she was insistent. And I, yeah, I don't know how else to explain it. Yeah. But so how far back do, like, when were, is the Serenette, like, first invented? It was invented in the 1700s. Okay. I could not find any information on why people invented them. All I could find was there was an instrument called the flageolet before the serenade. And the flageolet was like a clarinet shaped, kind of probably like a recorder. And people who wanted to train their birds could learn how to play this instrument and play it for their birds. And then the bird would learn the music. But you would have to play the same song over and over again, and you would have to be willing to learn the instrument and the fingerings. And I think the serenet must have come out of people deciding, well, we could automate that, right? Just pretty great. Would you like to hear a song? Yes, Can I please? please? <laughs> All right. So this is my. <laughs> did you know? Do you know how to crank it? Okay, yeah, that way. Faster. Um, 
sounds like a bird. It sounds yeah. like a bird singing Oh Susanna. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And y'all are welcome to come up here afterwards to look at it because I'll even you can see from here. Um, yeah, so, so it's got a, a bladder in there. Yeah, it's it's, yeah, it's a bellows. And so that's what makes it not a music box. It's a barrel organ because it traps air. And as you crank, the, um, the cylinder goes around and it makes these little pin steps go up and down and that opens the holes to the tent and pipes in the back. And then the pipes make the sound. And your descriptions of it being played and manufactured are very detailed. I mean, so one of the things that, yeah, so there's all, so I've got all the little, yeah. So what's interesting, and I mean, this comes up, I'm not giving a spoiler, is these are then shipped to the U.S. for women to teach canaries to sing and like make, was there a contest? I feel like there's Yeah, there's a canary contest. Canary contest. But you have to think, I guess, you know, these people in France, it's a, a, a great woodworking and, and, you know, trade that they've learned, but they're selling it to people who don't want to do anything but teach their canaries to sing. It, it's kind of, it's so um, opposites. And there were violin makers in the town too, and I thought about what it would have been like to be a violin maker, knowing that you're making these beautiful instruments for people to put their own energy into, and to learn songs, and maybe to compose, versus the people who were making these barrels that played O Susanna, and for He's a Jolly Good Fellow, for the American audience. Yeah. And, I mean, they're, you can come up and see later, but they're pretty rudimentary construction. Uh, the pieces are kind of rough hewn. There's no, when you think of a music box, you think of maybe a ballerina coming up, or the fancy case. This is just a plain walnut case. They're very utilitarian. And yet they are ridiculously whimsical because you can't really call an instrument that was meant to train canaries utilitarian with a straight face, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, and then we have a character that collects them. Yes. So there's no other need for them other than their beauty. I mean, they're, they're just a collector's item. They're not any utility to them. But it's so interesting to, you know, have that desire to collect, and we all do. I used to collect shot glasses, and I don't even drink. Um, <laughs> so, um, I know we wanted to talk a little bit too, just about, um, you know, does anybody have like questions about being like a writer, or, you know, do you have advice looking at something that took you 15 years, you know, that to some people might seem like, oh my gosh, that's so long, and to other people are like, I've been working on one for longer. So, where? <laughs> What maybe like finally got you to that point where you felt like it was ready to to show people, or you know, what's your writing style? Well, I thought I was done a lot of times, and I can't even tell you when the final no, no, really, I'm done. Um, it was probably after I changed the ending, but I thought it was done with the old ending, and I got feedback that. I had really written two novels, and I think that was a legit piece of feedback. Um, Henri has an arc, and in the, he's the protagonist, and in the final third of this book introduced a whole new set of characters and a whole new demographic, and I did years of research, and I just, it's all gone. So I think sometimes one piece of advice I have is it's okay to let things go phase of the book, and it's okay if you realize that you make your plot way too complicated to make it shorter. I was really worried about how some of my friends who had seen drafts would react to the new ending, and it, I got two thumbs up, but it, that was nerve-wracking after spending so much time on this ending that I, I dropped. Um, I, you know, I see the one thing I've been thinking a lot about is how, as writers, how many of you are writers? I know Amber is. How many writers? Um, sometimes we get stuck on a project and we can't let it go and it's okay. And there are other times when we get stuck on a project and we really should start something else. And then you start feeling like frustration, it doesn't feel okay anymore. And I think we need to listen to ourselves. I have a friend who's been working on a novel for as long or longer than this, and it's 
a great novel, but she keeps workshopping it. And she recently hired a freelance editor to take care of it. And she reported, he has all the same feedback that I've gotten before that I thought I fixed and there's still more of this. And then she said, but I just really want to keep writing this new project. She's been working on a new book and the joy is back. And I hope that her, I hope that the, the long time novel gets published, but the fact that she moved on to something else that's bringing her joy and happiness is huge. And I would say that I think singing lessons got to be like that for me, where I was like, oh, it's a book. You know, it just it still didn't sell, or I don't know if this is, you know. And I sat down over COVID and wrote a draft of a novel I had started five years ago. And we had gotten a new puppy, as people did in pandemic times. And he really liked to sit on my lap. His name is Waffles. So I was stuck on the couch a lot with this little puppy on my lap. And I was like, you know, I should just work on this new book because I don't know what else to do with this book. You know, it's that, that negative self-talk. So I sat with the dog on my lap and in two or three months, I had a draft of a new novel. And it felt so good. And I was like, I'm sure there are problems. However, it just felt good. And I realized that I, when you work on something for so long, it's like your muscles get cramped, right? Like you just get tight. And in writing this other draft, suddenly I found a publisher for this book, rewrote the ending, and then a book was coming out. And meanwhile, I have this whole other draft that went to a freelance editor and my agent's giving me feedback and so like I just hopefully by the end of the summer that's ready to go out that's awesome and yeah. I just I think sometimes we hold ourselves back I guess is what I'm saying and I can see like if someone had told me that 10 years ago or 8 years ago and I sat down and read, written the next book I would have taken what I had learned and taken that sense of confidence back to this book and maybe found a home faster as it is, I raised children, and the book grew at the same time, and a lot of the motherhood in the book, I needed to do living first to be able to write those characters. Yeah. But I think the sticking piece, I was talking to another writer last night after Powell's, a Powell's event, and she's been working on the same one project, and she said, I just can't let it go. This is my story. I want to go out and talk to families about grief, and I want to tell my story, and I want to reach people. So she's obviously like still deeply in the work, whereas I have been like, ah, I can't let it go. So I think it depends on where you are as a writer, but if you get frustrated, just to shake it off and just go play. And it doesn't even have to be writing. It can be like make a collage or go bring some watercolors to the park and make, make a big soggy mess of your paper because you've never done watercolors before. You know, just mess, yeah. mess it up. Stretching the artistic muscles. Well, I know you have um, a selection to read to us. Actually, now that I have my phone go off, I'll check the time. We're perfect on time if you want to okay. do that. Yeah. Sure. A couple pages? Yes, please. Okay. Well, I asked Julie what I should read, and um, she really loved the idea of sharing some of the canary pieces, which I haven't shared yet in, in public, so this will be fun. Now that you've heard the serenade, I don't think, there's not a, I, there's a whole arc that comes before this, but eventually Henri gets to meet his first canaries. And so I think there's a whole lot of story that I don't need to explain to get you to Henri arriving in upstate New York to meet his father's best customer. All right. So they're, they're walking up the stairs now. And Delia is the woman who's collected a lot of serenades and, uh, and canaries also. As they walked, Delia explained how she had lost some of her flock due to arsenic poisoning. The wallpaper fumes had risen from the men's smoking parlor. Chili's green, she called it. It took my husband, too. I'm sorry, Henri said. So am I, Delia said. Alistair and I got along well most of the time. I should add that Chili's green, there were like pages, there was a whole a whole thing about this color and a woman wearing a gown that was Julie's green and then she died because she was inhaling the fumes and I had to let all that go too but in that so I read that just a little bit I think of that poor woman who died on the ship who obviously never existed 
but just to look back and say, okay, I'll keep on to canaries. They stopped in front of a leaded glass wall, just as Henri's father had described it. Inside, peppery dots of color flitted around in the air as if the layers of rainbows had peeled apart from each other. Celia unlocked the aviary and beckoned him inside. It smelled like the root cellar back home. The birds flapped their wings and called to each other. Delia recited their names. She had 14 left now in brilliant hues of yellow, green, white, and flabbergasting orange. They weren't singing any songs, he knew. Not even measures of songs, he knew. The cacophony had a sumptuous and reverent humor. Ha, he exulted. These are exquisite, every one of them. I can hardly figure out where to look. Which ones are trained? None of these, Delia said. They're all hens. Henri didn't understand. I didn't think they could sing at all. Delia said they sing their own way, however they want, depending on how they're feeling. They can't memorize whole songs like the cocks. He had gone his whole life thinking the wrong thing about girl canaries. Hens. Because of what his father told him. And his father had been here, in this very aviary. How could a piece of valuable information like this get lost? But they can sing, he said. She swept a hand around the aviary. What do you think? Henri decided he preferred this wild, imprecise musicianship to any waltz or dance he and his father pinned on barrels. These hens reminded him of the lace makers back home, when the girls each had something to say and talked over each other with zeal. I love them, he said. He found himself particularly mesmerized by a small bird of brilliant yellow hue with an irrepressibly twittery voice, only to shift his focus onto an orange one and then a white, and then another yellow, or perhaps it was the same as the first. He compared these brilliant birds with a solitary illustration from the workshop. Same beak, same wings, same funny little feet, but the drawing had been gray and dulled by fingerprints. He remembered suddenly how Ame had waltzed in and touched the canary like it had belonged to her. How Papa, the night in the parlor, had lectured him about luck. Ame and her aunts looked more like that image of a canary than her real rambunctious self. De Delia's canaries, on the other hand, reminded him of Mirabai and its very brightest day, and also of clouds and sunset and sunrise and the sponge sugar a traveling magician once brought through town. The way these birds sang whatever they want, made it wanted made him giddy. His father and grandfather and great-grandfather had spent their lives forcing etudes and sonatas over natural ebullient trails. Now that he heard the birds' voices himself, he could not imagine the business of changing them. He thought suddenly of his grandmother, Serene. Somehow, without ever having left France, she had suspected this, how human music couldn't possibly be better than the bird kind. It was just different. Well, I'd love to open it up to um, questions. So if anybody has any questions about the book, writing, publishing, um, please ask away. Amber, <laughs> it struck me while you were reading that you read like a poet, these poems. I'm wondering if you have a read aloud portion of your process. I, I do, but only usually much later in a book's life. Um, and not, not really during the writing process. It's usually, oh my gosh, somebody's invited me to speak somewhere and I need to practice this and see how it sounds. And then I change it as I, as I read it for the reading. And I have to say, like, I'm making changes all the time whenever I open up. This is my spiral bound copy. Highly recommend when you have a book published to go to your local print shop and get a spiral bind because then it's what? And you can mark it up and you don't get it confused with everything. <laughs> so, um, yeah, my friend Robert Hill, who was going to originally be here, uh, had a um, major health setback and wasn't able to come talk tonight with me. And he writes out loud, and his sentences are all music. That's why I wanted to talk with him, because I just admire his work so much. Um, but they just, they're ebullient and rambunctious, and I think his first novel had a the opening sentence that was six pages or something legendary. And a lot of semicolons and a lot of a lot of dashes and he writes out loud. And before it goes on the page, he's read it out loud. Um, I tend to be on the later side of it. But I 
do have a background in poetry, so thank you for that. More questions? Writing questions? Publishing? What? Can you tell us anything about the new project? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so it turns out, because I had this strange upbringing with automatons in my bedroom and music boxes as my, as my siblings, <laughs> Uh, I'm really fascinated by musical history and what it was like before, I mean, obviously before we all had cell phones, right, before we had music on demand, but even before radio and before the idea that we could just turn a device on in our house and hear it. And so music boxes certainly are a piece of that. If you wanted to listen to music after dinner, you either had to learn to play the piano forte or the violin or you, or, or you had a music box. Uh, but my new book is set in the 1920s, and it has a Tin Pan Alley thread of the songwriting and women and musical history and the past with some magic thrown in seems to be my jam. And the magic surprised me in this book and the new book, but it's a way that I can impose modern sensibilities on the story without feeling like I'm rewriting history. So by just shifting the story. The town where they made these instruments was pretty economically depressed, and it was probably a pretty rough job to make the same parts all over and over and over again. And yet the instrument was so whimsical, I felt like I needed a fun flavor to the story, so I added magic to allow it and change the name. Miracor is the real town. So I did the same thing in the 1920s book so that I could be playful with it. Well, that actually brings up another question then. So so in the book, though, Henri, his father, his grandfather, I mean, they are a more well-to-do family because they're, he's the master craftsman, and then, you know, Henri is supposed to take over, and there's all these apprentices. But if it's not, I mean, what you're saying, it's there's a lot of descriptions of putting the things together, which I really appreciated. But it's not, so how is he making his money if it's, you know, obviously he's just from shipping them to the U.S.? Yep. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. So compared to the farmers and the baker, I mean, the far, nothing grows in the town because it's sunny all the time. So the farmers are really out of luck. There's there's not enough water for their crops. And they, they frizzle and burn. <laughs> it's a bummer. Um, but, yeah, com and compared to the violin folks and the serenade, the, the violin people kind of went down on the serenade makers a little bit. Uh, I cut a lot of that out, but mm -hmm. in my head I know that's true because, <laughs> because of the, the, art, the artistry of making a violin have that rich, lustrous sound. That's not something that you need to do for a serenade. You need to know how to pin the next song. Well, you can change songs, so I mean, that's probably a reason why Delia would collect them. Yeah, but well, that there are, each instrument has, well, this one has eight, but some of them have 10 or 12 songs, so you can, but if you wanted to train your canary to sing it, you have to play the one song right. over and over and over again. Yeah, can we all imagine having to sit there and <laughs> crank it? I think our modern uh, vibes, we can't, because that would... I wouldn't be able to sit still that long. It's not something I would enjoy. No, and it's, yeah, the repetition and yeah. the high pitch. I mean, it's not, it's a funny instrument, but it's not like, oh my gosh, I can't wait to hear the serenade again, right? <laughs> I mean, it's, I mean it's, it's an oddity. Um, it's a curiosity, and I find it absolutely delightful, but I can play with Susanna, and I'm good for a while. Like, I don't have to, I don't pick it up after dinner and play another song. <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, they do talk about the orders have lessened. Yes. You know, there is that it has gone out of favor a little. Yeah, they, I, yeah. I sort of decided, I don't know when they really went out of favor, but I, given the timeline and the research I did when I wanted to set, set the book, I decided I was going to set it in the, later in the life cycle of the serenade. So there used to be several serenade makers in the town, and now Arnie's father is the only one. So that's why he has kind of prestige. Um, and I like the idea of the economic stakes that they have built a whole family dynasty passing this workshop down and the apprentices I never really speculate about where they go but once they are finished with their apprenticeships they I think they go 
to Switzerland or they go work, mm -hmm. you know, they, they take their, what they've learned, there really aren't other surrogate net makers to go work for, so they, So in your research, um, what was the uh, timeline of like the flagellet? Like did that go out of it was, favor? Because that yeah. is one where you could travel yeah. and more play, say like a violin, you know, have some sort of something in a town square and, and get money, you know, you're a traveling musician, but you couldn't be a traveling you know, serenade player. So Although I tried to run I had a whole, <laughs> there, was a, there was going to be a sequel with a, a man who decides he's gonna he's gonna go over to New England and meet the women with their canaries and like sell his services and stay in a town for however many months it would take for all the birds in the town to learn the music and then he would move on. But yeah, you're right, you couldn't stand out in right. the restaurant corner. As a kid I used to do that with my parents. Uh, they have a street organ well, okay, they have multiple street organs, but one particular street organ is like, you know, yay high. And my dad and mom and I would get dressed up in costume, and my dad would crank the organ, and I would come over here and play the stops and decide when is violin, when's piccolo, when's French horn. Wow. And it was really like the, the show with the monkey, right? But I was the monkey. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It was good times. Yeah. <laughs> but did, the, did you notice, because I know you said some of your research in the flageolet yeah. appears, but is that... Like, did that morph into something else? I was that able, also just died? I think it also just died. I didn't really find it. I mean, again, if you're listening to something that's really high pitched, it's not mm -hmm. as exciting as like the what we think of as the barrel organ, or, like the one I just demonstrated. Um, yes, when you said recorder, like my own ears yeah, right? just from even elementary school remember yep. all of us playing. Yep. Yes. So I, there's so little about them, and I should add too, I didn't have, I, I was never able to find a recording of a flageolet. Mm -hmm. I only heard, saw it in um, in uh, mechanical music books that my parents have collected over the years. It wasn't, I didn't really, I can't remember how far I looked on the internet, but I didn't really find much about it. Yeah. Definitely in print, yeah. so. So besides the fact that the, you know, serenade itself is French, did you like, I loved reading this because I took French in high school. I took it in undergrad. I'm terrible <laughs> at it. I've often been told, oh, you have such a Midwestern accent. I'm like, I'm from Oregon. <laughs> but thanks. I loved, like, in my head, I, I think I even read a couple sentences to my mom, but I was like, I was doing the pronunciations. So or I was like, I really hope this is right. <laughs> but it sounded so good in my head. So how, like, was that fun to kind of bring in those words? It was so fun. Do you speak French? I did high school okay. and I took one term in college and was out of there. But <laughs> but my best friend lived in London when I was a little kid and we would go over and visit. So I spent time in Germany and in France okay. and this their town was on the German border. So I had a sense of landscape and I had a sense of families and farmhouses and things. And then the French a little bit, I mean, really it was just stuff I remembered from high school. I definitely went back a couple of times and, and yeah. looked for something, but I figured if it was a big phrase, I probably wouldn't, um, that I would have to look up to figure out how to put on the page, then probably it's not right. as translatable, and I didn't want to have to like put actual translations in it. I just wanted the flavor, Yeah. like the book Chocolat. I haven't gone back to read it to see how she dealt with French, but but the aura of the of the French village is there. And that's what I wanted. Well, and even just the names, because you know when you see the name George with an S, like it is pronounced George, and I'm like, oh, I just like or Henri, and I'm like, oh, I know, I <laughs> see that in my head. Um, I just I really enjoyed it, and it was so hard to write a review for it because I was really just trying to be like, I love this book. I don't know how else to explain <laughs> what has happened. And I find that whenever we have a book club, whenever we all love the book, we actually have a harder time talking about it because it's so hard to kind of capture if it made you feel, like I said, we, it was 
January on the Oregon coast, terrible weather, and I'm reading about this little you know villa in France where the sun is out 24 seven, and I'm like, what's that like? <laughs> sun. Sun, and and it's all Henri's father's fault. Yeah. Because the day he stops crying, the sun comes out and never goes away, and everyone's happy at first, and then they're like, oh no, we can't grow anything, and we can't go anywhere because we're getting sunburned and you know like so um so that they blame George. yes yeah and then Henri has to live with that too because then he's the son of the sunbringer yes very um it's very lyrical <laughs> there's just yeah um so as we wrap up if there's no other uh questions we do have copies for purchase uh or we'll sign them and um, I just really appreciate everyone who made it out tonight. I know there are a million things to do in Bend on any given evening. So thank you so much for coming and uh, spending this hour with us in our little bookstore, which I would hope would fit in in a French countryside, you know, wherever. So um, thank way, you. I feel like yes, <laughs> we're, you know, we're like the little, we're just a little shop around the corner. Um, Thank you again so much for making the travel oh, for Rain, the so Serenette. Um, I see you do have some little postcards too, little bookmarks. Um, and then, like I said, Laura is publishing amazing books. Actually, do you want to tell everyone about the book you just acquired? Yeah, I just acquired a short story collection called No God Like the Mother by Keisha Ajose Fisher. And she, I, ta I had coffee with her the other day and I got the full story about she just has always wanted to be a writer. She grew up in Nigeria and she wanted to get this book out in the world so she self-published. And she won the Oregon Book Award for fiction wow. with her self-published book. Which is, sure it's only ha it's happened twice. Say. Joyce Cresswell, Cher Cherry Cresswell okay. um, won it also and she went through Indigo Editing. Okay. And this, so and the first, and it was a couple years before Keisha. So, but it's only happened twice in the whole history of the award program. Yeah. And her press went out of business, as they tend to do. And she reached out to me and said, "I'm going to the LA Times Book Festival, and I have no books. Do you have any advice for me?" And I was like, "Uh, no. But are you looking to reprint that?" <laughs> so, moving through a couple cycles and conversations with her and with her agent, thinking about what we could do, Forest Avenue acquired her book. And it's Publishers Marketplace official, which means it's in it's in the trade journal. It's listed. It's a real thing. So we're hoping it'll come out in winter, depending on supply chain and paper. Yeah. And I, I we get an Oregon Book Award now. We didn't have we didn't, <laughs> we didn't earn it in advance, but we're but we can put it on the cover now. Yeah. And Keisha is. She said, I just keep crying. She's just. This is. It's so special. Um, I've never been able to do a reprint because, if it, especially if it's a book that all your friends and family have gotten, who's the audience? But her book is so good and it won awards, and it didn't really get out of Oregon. And my press has national distribution, and so the sales team is going to go out, and the, the sales rep is going to go to the main bookstores, and someone's going to go to the Ohio bookstore, someone's going to go to wherever, you know, and, and sell this book into stores. And so it's going to have a new life, which is, oh, it almost never happens. And I'm really excited. Well, then we'll just have to have you guys both come down here. Oh, and that would be so fun. And we'll do this again. She's already said, I will do anything to get me out there. I want to talk to people. And I was like, I love you. Yes. <laughs> well, yeah, we will definitely have it. Um, so, yes, please uh, buy books. Feel free to shop the rest of the store while you're in here and we're putting things away, but thank you again. And if you knew someone who couldn't be here tonight but would love to hear more about this, please uh, send them to our YouTube channel. I'll have the video up uh, tomorrow. So with that, I think we'll wrap up. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. All right. I will leave this to you. I'm going to turn this off real quick. Thank you.